What up, my fucks? <laughs> it's your boy, the hater up in this bitch, and uh, I've been busy the last few days answering some comments, you know what I'm saying? Things of that nature, literally arguing with this one guy about whether Baphomet exists or not in my comment section. But we've come to it now, so let's get back to what we like to do, and not, that's not whether Baphomet did it or not, but let's talk about uh, some wrestling, motherfucker, some wrestling. It was a big day, or at least it should have been, right? It was the first episode of AEW since CM Punk's debut. So um, the way that AEW has worked um, is not the way that AEW, I think, is going to work uh, going forward. You know what I mean? Like the way AEW has worked the last few weeks, maybe even the last few months, is that they keep every week, they keep having something interesting there, you know? But now that they're getting like people like CM Punk, the something interesting there is just something like CM Punk happens to be there, right? Which honestly is not that exciting. It's like, first of all, let's get our expectations down a bit, right? Uh, CM Punk, I'm not going to say that he's not a big get. He obviously is a big get for AW, but he's not fucking Hulk Hogan either. You know what I'm saying? You cannot carry a show forward by having CM Punk cut one promo. You know what I'm saying? You just can't. He's just not good enough at promos, nor is he compelling enough as a wrestler, right? But we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, let's talk about some of the matches first. My All right, so first up, we have, uh, I think it was the first match. I don't remember. Uh, Orange Cassidy versus Matt Hardy. Uh, I, I've always said Matt Hardy. I've always liked Matt Hardy. I mean, uh, sometimes he, he goes a little overboard with the whole, like, delete thing. But now he's big money Matt. He found the right time to reinvent himself once again. You know what I'm saying? He could have just rolled that into the sunset, but it really shows creativity. Matt Hardy is one of the most creative people in wrestling. He's like, wh what people say about Bray Wyatt is actually true about Matt Hardy. You know what I'm saying? This guy actually reinvents new personas, you know? They're not all hits. Some of them are misses. Like, for example, his debut in AW with him, like, having all of his personas simultaneously and changing from one to the other during a match. Like, by being thrown in a pool. Like, that's stupid. But Big Money Matt, I like Big Money Matt. Um, it gives Matt Hardy something to do. And uh, Matt Hardy can still go. You know, he's still, he's still as good as he always has been. Uh, Matt Hardy's great, you know. Uh, it's really weird because, like, 10, 15 years ago when he was on SmackDown being a jobber to, like, Finley and shit... Matt Stryker would be like, Matt Hardy doesn't have time to go to the gym, you know? He's like, because he was like flabby and shit like that. And it's like, he really came back from that big time, you know? He was like a jobber, and now it's like, where the fuck is Finley now? Where's MVP now, you know? These people that were supposed to be like, the real breakout stars. Not necessarily Finley, but like, all the people that Matt Hardy would get his ass beat by. You know, like losing to like, Eric Escobar. You know what I mean? Like, where the fuck are these motherfuckers now? Matt Hardy continues, and Matt Hardy is doing just fine. However, he has to lose to Orange Cassidy because... AEW really wants to differentiate themselves from WWE and I think more importantly from TNA because TNA had this thing where they would have legends come and the legends would beat up all the people that were there and this was a problem in TNA it wasn't a problem when Kurt Angle beat Samoa Joe who gives a shit about that Kurt Angle was like one, one of the best wrestlers of all time but it was a problem for example when Val Venus came for like two weeks and he beat up Christopher Daniels you know like that shouldn't have happened it's like dude it's Val Venus like he was a complete jobber he was like a Sunday Night Heat wrestler at that point and I like Val Venus he's one of my favorites from the Attitude Era but at the time he he was not the Attitude Era Val Venus he was the guy that was being booked as a jobber and he was still in good shape and everything else but it's like you can't take a guy that was a jobber in one company and then make him uh you know like like a big star or have him beat your big stars in another company it has to be commensurate right so Matt Hardy was like a mid-carder, and now he's coming in here as a mid-carder. And Cassidy is a little bit above him, so he wins. So I get it. However, it's preposterous, because Orange Cassidy looks like he's never been to the gym. And Matt Hardy looks like he has been to the gym. So it's as simple as that. Um, Matt Hardy got busted open. It was badass. Um, I mean, Matt Hardy's just cool, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Orange Cassidy wins. I forget how. Uh, probably, uh, wait, no, he, yeah, it was so bad, actually. Because Matt Hardy, uh, first of all, like, he hits Matt Hardy with a swanton with his hands in his pockets, and the twist of fate. And then Matt Hardy goes for the leech, which is like the new name for his double underhook submission. He goes for the leech, and then in the most disrespectful way ever, Orange Cassidy just sits on him to, to do like a pin and puts his hands in his own pockets. It was like, this is Matt Hardy, bro. This isn't Joey Janela, you know what I mean? You can do that with Joey Janela and get away with it, but this is Matt Hardy. Like, like have some have some respect for the fact that Matt Hardy is like, a, a future Hall of Famer, you know what I mean? And Orange Cassidy will never be a future anything. He won't even be a future world champion. So there you have it. Um, it wasn't great. Uh, it was what it was. Then we had another waste of time. It was Jericho coming out. And Jericho pretty much said um, that, like, if he, he, he challenged MJF to, another, to, to uh, one more match at the pay-per-view. 
And if he loses, Jericho retires. Now, here's the thing. Like, I'm looking forward to it because, I mean, I'm hoping Jericho wins. Because obviously he's not going to retire like this. But he might lose and, and retire for a little bit or something. I don't know, you know? I mean, Jericho's last match is probably not going to be in AEW, let's be honest. So, um, but that's neither really here nor there. The thing that bothered me about this wasn't even the fact that, like, that, you know, the, their last match wasn't the conclusion it was supposed to be because that happens all the time in wrestling. The real problem was, if you knew you could have another match at the pay-per-view, why did you book it this way, you know? Why did you book it this way? You know? I'm thinking to myself, uh, if you were going to have two matches and one was going to be at the pay-per-view, it would have made more sense to have the, the first match first, right? Have it, like, way off the bat, like, six weeks ago, you know? Seven weeks ago. And then have MJF win the way he did. Then you have Jericho go through the labors of Jericho and then get his rematch and beat MJF. Otherwise, what was the point of the labors of Jericho, you know? Just so he could get another rematch immediately afterwards? But whatever. It is what it is. Uh, I'd rather see this match than see, like, you know, most of the other shit that we see um, on AEW because Jericho's awesome. So we'll see, you know? The segment was pretty shitty for everything I just uh, mentioned. But... Um, I mean, whatever. It's It has Jericho, so it's better than, like, most things that you're going to see, period, in terms of wrestling. Anyways, um, then next up, we have the Lucha Brothers versus the Varsity Blondes. I mean, like, it's like, who, who, who thought that the Varsity Blondes, these two motherfuckers, had any chance of beating the Lucha Brothers? Like, I like the Varsity Blondes, but the Lucha Brothers are obviously going to be the ones that go over this, all right? And that's what happened, motherfuckers. It was as simple as that. Next, we had Red Velvet versus the girl that stole my name, Jamie Hayter, all right? Jamie Hayter is garbage, all right? This girl is, like, weirdly big. I don't even know how to explain it. She's not, like, fat or anything. She's just big, you know? Maybe because Red Velvet is small. But um, Jamie Hayter is just, is just horrible, you know? Like, I can't think of a wrestler that's been introduced in a worse way than Jamie Hayter, you know? She came back wearing a hat, like, and took it off in this, like, in this way to, to, to suggest that, like, oh, I'm back, like... I wore the hat to hide my identity, but it's like, even if you didn't wear a hat, the reaction would be exactly the same because nobody knows who the fuck Jamie Hayter is. Um, the match pretty much ended with Red Velvet completely botching a moonsault, like a standing moonsault. She just overshoots it and misses completely. Now, at least Red Velvet had the wherewithal to realize that she missed and then act like she missed. You know, she didn't pretend that she hit it to have Michael Cole say in the background, oh, he, he didn't get all of it. You know, she didn't get all of it. Like, that was good. But... That doesn't erase the fact that she missed a standing moonsault. It's like, you're supposed to be doing wrestling and entertaining people. And if you can't do the move correctly, in that you miss it completely, you shouldn't be employed. You know, it's like, wrestling as a concept hinges upon the fact that it's supposed to be competition, right? I, obviously, it's fake, but it's supposed to be competitive. So the idea is that when a new wrestler, you know, appears, like, for example... The thing that popped into my head. When Eric Young came to NXT to challenge Samoa Joe, they're like, the announcers were like, Eric Young is one of the hottest free agents. The implications of this are that Eric Young is kicking ass wherever the fuck he's wrestling, and now he's made it to WWE. And because he's the hottest free agent, or one of the hottest free agents, the implications are that he's better than like any other jobber would be when they start in WWE. Because otherwise, if you don't know who Eric Young is, how do you know that he's like a real challenger and that he's not some guy that's going to get squashed or anywhere in between, right? So the same thing needs to apply to AEW, where it's like, if you have someone that's in there, that's in your roster, and is like, whatever, 13 and 2, whatever the fuck Red Velvet is, you know, if you have someone like that, the implications are that this person is good at what they do, and that the people that have worse records are worse than her. So when the person that's one of your best misses a moonsault, right, that really makes the rest of your roster look like shit. And then Jamie Hayter hits like a shitty clothesline from hell type move, and wins. It wasn't good, it was bad, you know? The botched moonsault was really dumb, but the only th good thing that came out of it was that the botched moonsault led to the finish of the match. They didn't, like, try to redo it. They didn't try to, like, have, uh, what's-her-face, um, uh, do her move anyways. You know, so it almost made it look like she botched it on purpose, like she missed it on purpose. Like, that was part of the, part of the, whatever, story, but obviously it wasn't, you know what I mean? So, um, Hater is just not good. Velvet is not really good either, but whatever. Then, uh, CM Punk's debut was next. Now, I'm reading Bleacher Report just to refresh my memory on what happened and the order in which it happened. And they gave this thing an A. This was not good. Alright? This was garbage. And I'll explain why. 
CM Punk came out, said the same exact thing that he said last week. You know, a lot of people nowadays come out here and say the exact same thing they've been saying all the time, right? CM Punk did exactly that. He came out and he was like, he was like, I'm here because I want to wrestle young stars. And then he said a bunch of shit and then he's like, especially Darby Allen. That was the point he was trying to make. Basically, he tried to put people over by naming them. You know what I mean? Uh, he named Jungle Boy, Ray Phoenix, uh, Brian Pillman Jr., um, who else? Uh, I think that's it, actually. And then Darby Allen. That's all, all I can remember. I just found it interesting because he's like Brian Pillman Jr. Uh, and, and Pentagon as well. So um, these guys are good for sure. So like it'd be um, it'd be nice to see him wrestle them. I mean, not, not Jungle Boy. Jungle Boy's all right. But the other ones are pretty good. Uh, Brian Pillman, obviously, is a jobber. But it'd be nice to see him get a push at some point. So the point is, uh, that's all he did. He pretty much just, just came there. And he was just there to be like, I'm here. Right? People lost their minds once again. Uh, the pop wasn't obviously as big as it was in Chicago. I mean, that's just common sense. I, I know some people are like pointing to that as, as saying like, oh, it's already waning, you know, but that's not, that's not very, uh, uh, that isn't a very genuine argument. You know, some of my friends were saying that to me. They're like, well, did you hear the pop difference? And I'm like, dude, first of all, one of them is like the pop that he got in his hometown in his first appearance in a wrestling ring in seven years. And the other one is the week after that. You know what I mean? Obviously the bigger pop is going to be, it's going to be much, much bigger in his hometown, especially Chicago being like, what it is, um, you know, a dump. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Actually, I've never been, but you know what I'm saying? Like, Cheryl being this, like, dumpy, like, you know, neckbeard wrestling like, fan uh, place. So, there you go, you know? So, um, I'm just saying this. I'm just saying this, motherfucks. This was a wasted opportunity. He said the same things again. And basically, uh, the one thing that was of note was that he said, I'm retiring my name, my nickname, of the voice of the voiceless. Because, uh, here there is a voice, right? And like, and people back there listen. And this is like everything that's wrong with AEW. It's this idea that like people should listen to CM Punk and people should listen to the fans. You should not listen to the fans. If the fans were good at understanding what makes good wrestling, they wouldn't be fans. They'd be Vince McMahon, motherfucks. It's just like with every other TV show where people are like, like I never watched Game of Thrones, but I know that the last season was a disappointment to everyone. And everyone's like, oh, that's not how I should have ended it. Like, go fucking make it yourself, man. The people that made it, the people that got you hooked for eight years, whatever it was, decided they're going to end it this way. You, and then people are like, I don't like the way it ended. Oh, it didn't make any sense to me. And maybe it was a shitty ending. But the point is, the people in charge, the people in charge of creative are the creative ones, right? In this case, having CM Punk come out and do the same thing twice, which apparently he thinks is good because people in the back listen, you know? Like, that's not good to me. I don't enjoy that at all, right? And then people started doing a yes chant, which was uh, interesting, and he kind of botched it. And basically, he said that, like, that's some other guy's gimmick um, or some other guy's shtick or whatever he said. Uh, and, like, you have to be a bit more patient, uh, you know, basically saying that Daniel Bryan's on his way, you know? Uh, people lost their mind at that, too. It's like, great, take Daniel Bryan. The guy hasn't done anything for, like, years. So, um, it wasn't good. Uh, Bleacher Report says it was a fiery promo, but it wasn't uh, a fiery promo. And the tease of Daniel Bryan that they also mentioned, it wasn't really a tease. It, like... It was more of like, how can CM Punk get another bigger pop for himself? It was one of those. He was like, I'll say something clever here because I'm sure he knows uh, to an extent when and if Daniel Bryan is coming. I'm sure he is. Next up, we had like a jobber match. It was a, it was a six-man tag. It was Moxley, Darby Allen, and Eddie Kingston who for some reason just keep teaming together like, um, and keep saving each other's asses and things of that nature uh, versus uh, uh, the wingmen, which, are like, which were a guy named J.D. Drake. He's the fat one. Cesar Bononi and uh, Dolph Ziggler's little brother. Um, I mean, whatever. Who gives a shit? Like, Sting was on ringside. Peter Avalon. Pretty Peter Avalon was on ringside. Uh, the match wasn't good. I mean, what can I say about this? Like, it's like, like who cares? I mean, coffin drop to the, to the fat guy. One, two, three. Obviously, the three guys that are, are, are like almost main event, that are main event players are going to beat the three guys that come from AW Dark. This would be the equivalent of having like, I don't know, Lashley, Drew McIntyre, and Roman Reigns versus, like, Lucha House Party and, like, Drew Gulak. It would be the equivalent of that and, like, having, like, some competitive match. So, anyways, um, yeah, it, it was whatever. Nobody really cared about any of this. It's completely uh, uh, inconsequential and unentertaining. Then we had Christian Cage and Kate Omega having a little promo. It wasn't really good. Frank Kazarian came and made the, made the save. I love Christian, obviously. But uh, it wasn't very good. It just it just wasn't very very entertaining. Then we have the Gun Club, Billy Gunn and his two kids. One of them looks exactly like him. It's preposterous how much he looks like him. Um, and the factory, right? And they had the match. Uh, I forget how it ended. 
Uh, how did it end? Basically, Big Show distracted someone. I don't remember the move. The and uh, one of the one of the 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 sons pinned um, Q T Marshall. I mean, like, let's be real. I mean, like, we have Q T Marshall there. He's gonna feud with Big Show. He's lost to like Billy Gunn's kid. So it's like, obviously, motherfucks. Obviously, Big Show's gonna destroy him again. The nerds here at Bleacher Report say a feud like uh, Paul White and Q T Marshall a feud. No one asked for it. I asked for it, motherfucks. I like QT Marshall. He's fucking awesome. He's one of the best guys they have. And Big Show is awesome too. You know what I'm saying? Simple as that. So kiss my ass. Uh, before we talk about the Brock Anderson main event, which I mean, I think, you know, it speaks for itself, but we're going to talk about it anyways. We have to mention the promo by Dan Lambert, right? Dan Lambert, aka the hater, motherfucks. This guy came out there and said everything that I've been saying. Basically, he was like, these dudes uh, cry when CM Punk shows up to work. He's like their weak man, so they expect uh, to see weakness, you know, while they drink their soy lattes. He's 100% right about everything. I know it's like supposed to be tongue-in-cheek, but it's true. It's true, motherfucks. It's like you don't want to see real men because you're not a real man. And you you, you can't identify with that. You want to identify people like Daniel Bryan. So when Daniel Bryan bangs Brie Bella, you're like, oh my god, maybe I can do it too one day. No, you can't, motherfucks, because he's still more of a man than you. <laughs> but uh, just because Daniel Bryan is small compared to like John Cena doesn't mean he's like... Just as fat and unathletic as the rest of the neckbeards. But uh, Dan Lambert was 100% right. He did a good job putting over the men of the year. Because the men of the year have not done a good job putting themselves over. It's really quite simple. They need someone like Dan Lambert to put them over. They're not entertaining. They're not charismatic. Like, I mean, Ethan Page has some charisma. But, like, their whole thing is like, oh, look, we're going to dress nice and wear good shoes. And, like, you know, nice pants. And, like, you know, like, pretty much copy The Rock when he would wear the nice shirts. But have, like, none of the actual personality that is needed to put that shit over. So, that's what happened. In the, in the main event, we had Malachi Black versus Brock Anderson. Who continues to be the worst wrestler I've ever seen in my life. Brock Anderson, like, this is, like, the face of nepotism is Brock Anderson. This guy would never make it in wrestling if it weren't for his father. Obviously, we all know that. He's, he's skinny fat. He's, like, chubby. You know? He's chubby. He's not even skinny fat. He's, he's just chubby. Like, he's just a chubby dude. He's a chubby guy uh, with, like, he's already, like, balding, you know, and it's, like, his debut. He is generic. Um, he's not especially tall. He's obviously not good in the ring because he's new. I mean, there's all these things that just hold him back. I mean, he doesn't have a personality. He's going to be held back by, like, uh, Arn Anderson as well because it's, like, you you could be someone that has personality, you know what I'm saying? And that, that personality gets cold immediately because your father is Arn Anderson, you know? It's, like... This guy's like, it's going to be a, 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 an uphill battle for him to actually make an impact at some point. I hope he does because I don't have anything against the kid personally. But, um, I mean, hey, look at this. He's, he was 5-1 and one in tag matches. And then he had a main event match against Malachi Black. Uh, Malachi Black, before the match, said, like, you're going to have to roll out of the ring. Like, I'm going to give you a minute. You can roll out of the ring and take the disqualification. First of all, it's called a countout. Disqualification is when the referee says you've cheated and you can't wrestle anymore. So Malachi Black comes off as a retard for that reason. Um, Malachi Black, I, um, I mean, compared to Alistair Black, I like Malachi Black more because he's more direct. Uh, he's more vicious. He's a heel, which is good, I think. Um, he's, doing a, he's doing some things in a good way. Like, someone like him should be a heel because he's, like, evil-looking, number one. And two, like, he, hit, he kicks people in the head. And that's something a heel could do very well and better than a face. Long story short, the match starts for some reason. Brock Anderson gets a few moves in. Malachi Black knees him in the face, beats his ass, hits an exploder, kicks him in the face. Arn Anderson comes in. He tries to do the Black Mass on Arn Anderson, who just blocks it by just putting his... Like, the Black Mass is like one of the worst moves ever. You know, if you really think about it. Because it's like, people are like, oh, it comes out of nowhere. No, it doesn't. You know exactly how it's going to happen. You know he's going to kick you on your right side. It's like... Just hold your hand. If you're wrestling Malachi Black, just hold your hand in a boxing guard all, like on the right side. He'll never hit his finisher and you'll be able to beat his ass because he only has that move. The other moves he has are shitty. So, you know, Malachi Black has like one of the worst finishers ever. Like, it, it'd be cool if it was just like a move that he did once in a while or if it was like a finisher that he pulled out like once in a while and he had like another more reasonable and more, uh, you know, um, doable finisher that's not so fake and choreographed. But nonetheless, he... Uh, What's it called? Arn Anderson blocked it. So he just kicked him around the balls. And then while Anderson was holding his balls, he hit the black mass on him too. Right? And he put them both down. And the, and the show ended like this. Or did it, motherfucks. 
because then another main event they're in the making, Leon Ruff of AW, uh, Lee Johnson, or as JR called him, Johnny Lee, you know what I'm uh, Lee Johnson came out, and then for some reason Malachi Black ran away from Lee Johnson. He's like bigger and stronger than Lee Johnson. He's presented as being like at least 10 times better than him in terms of kayfabe. So why did he run away from, from Lee Johnson? He should have, what should have happened was Lee Johnson runs in there and he kicks him right in the face immediately, you know? And then Goldust comes out and he kicks him in the face. And then he just stands triumphant and this prompts Cody Rhodes to come back after he beat the shit up all his friends. It's going to happen, motherfucks. We're going to see Malachi Black versus Goldust. Or whatever the fuck, uh, Dustin Rhodes. We're going to see it, and that's how Cody's going to come back. You know? But whatever. It is what it is. No one really cares. Uh, this was not a main event quality match. It was not a main, main event quality uh, segment. The, the people involved, none of them are main event quality guys. In fact, two out of three of them are, like, going to be released. You know what I'm saying? Lee Johnson is never going to make it in, in wrestling. And Brock Anderson is probably never going to make it either. I mean, Lee Johnson, I, I guess he could be like a Leon Ruff, you know? Like he, could, he could be like a like what, like what the guy that would hang out with, with, uh, with Carmelo. I think his name was James. The, the blonde guy, James something, whatever. Like, he could be one of those guys. That's about it, motherfucks. Uh, the rest of this is just shit. Like, nobody, nobody wanted to see any of this, these things. So, as far as I'm concerned, AW took two steps forward uh, last week and now took ten steps back. Because this was the worst episode of AW Dynamite in months. In months, motherfuckers. They've consistently had good things. And this show had no star power. It's like, they didn't even have the Young Bucks. Typically, like, at least, I don't like the Young Bucks. But I recognize that they're stars in AEW. That they're presented as big deals. You know, I don't think any champion wrestled on, like, on the card at all. Not one champion wrestled. Maybe the women's champion. Who's the women's champion? Oh, Britt Baker. She didn't wrestle. She was just there. So, not, not one champion wrestled. Uh, not one member of, like, the elite wrestled. What the fuck's Adam Page? Adam Page should be out there wrestling every week, building up his resume for his eventual, like, title run. You know what I mean? But whatever, what are you going to do, right? It was garbage. I didn't like it. Kiss my ass, motherfucker.